I should mention I've started a recording of the session just to remind everybody on that. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm just very conscious that Scott Elliott hasn't joined us yet. So no, I think we've, we've okay. given another minute or something like that. Yeah, is that okay? I have that's, just, that's just um, I've just requested him to join, just in case, and um, yeah. still to get on, so we can make sure he's here. <laughs> Hello to you um, that are just joining us. I know there's a couple of you that have just come out of the waiting room and come in. So hello from wherever you're joining us from. Fantastic to see you all here today. We will be starting shortly. Please bear with us while we just wait for some of the other attendees. And like I said, we are recording the session today for so those that have not been able to join us or if you know people that want to watch the session today, um, we will be recording it and, and sharing that with you. So that's fantastic. Brilliant. I think we'll get started if that's OK. So I'm going to say good afternoon from Staffordshire. I know some of you won't be joining us from Staffordshire, but we're delighted to have you all here for our Heat Academy International um, uh, webinar today. And it's fantastic to see you all here. So many people um, interested in sort of the topic that we're discussing today. And it's delighted. I'm delighted to have you all here. Um, so as you can see on the screen, um, lovely Peter is sharing our um, our agenda for today so lots to um, continue on with and um, but Peter I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Perfectly fine thanks Laura for that and welcome to everybody to this uh, Heat Academy session which we are organizing today with in collaboration with Staffordshire Chamber of Commerce and also other local partners which would be present during the, the session. This is the first in a series of sessions we are planning to, to run in Staffordshire uh, focusing on the topics around the carbonisation of heating and related technologies. Uh, the next section, I could mention that already now, it's on 7th of July. And as you've all heard, uh, we are recording this session and we are also going to share uh, the presentations afterwards through a link which we send to you. Uh, the focus of, of this session, as is the coming section, is very much uh, looking at mobilizing local suppliers. We're going to highlight investments underway in the region of Staffordshire, but also in other parts of UK and abroad. 
Uh, and the idea is to, to show what is underway now and also to explain what are the technologies and solutions that will be implemented and perhaps most importantly, what are the requirements for, um, to become a supplier in the implementation of these solutions. Uh, and if there are skills gaps, we also want to highlight that there are opportunities to get training in collaboration with the training providers in Staffordshire, but also with other partners to, to the Heat, Net, uh, Heat Academy network. Uh, well, you have all seen the agenda for today. It's, it's quite a lot of topics we want to address. We wanted to make this a session to really make it wide. And then as we go forward into future sessions, we will be making them more specific, different uh, topics. Uh, the topic in you know, the reason for us all being here talking about these topics is uh, climate emergency. Climate emergency has been declared in Staffordshire, in the Council of Stoke and also in Stafford and across UK and in many countries. And I think we are all aware it's getting more and more acute and decarbonizing the economy is obviously a, a high uh, priority area in, in uh, basically every single discussion taking a, a place now, I would say, around the globe. And one of the key uh, elements of decarbonizing the economy is to reduce the fossils uh, which use, are used to drive our economy, but to reduce the fossil content in that very fast. Heating is an interesting topic. Half of the gas consumption in the UK is related to heating of buildings and almost 40% of all CO2 emissions in the UK are related to heating of buildings. So in that sense, it's, it's quite a low hanging fruit. It has been possible, as we're going to show in other countries, to actually decarbonize this heating system and do it relatively swiftly but it involves significant investments and it requires skills and development of the capacity and the supply chain locally. Uh, the critical drivers, well, obviously in the core of it, as I mentioned, it's climate emergency. And what I think most people in the industry now believe we're gonna see in a relatively short period of time, carbon taxation. Uh, we have Bob Barnes with us today who will highlight that topic uh, a bit more in detail later in the session. We also have risk drivers. I know the project of decarbonizing heating in Stoke, the heat network project was driven very much by the energy security topics. There was a shortage of gas following a very cold winter or during a very cold winter and that put the spotlight on energy security. Uh, it's also an increasingly interesting topic or concerning if depending on how you look at it the balance of trade uk is today importing half of the fossil fuels compared to 10 years ago when uk was a net exporter the share being imported every year is increasing and that in turn creates further risk for energy security but there are also opportunity drivers local regeneration we have seen and we're going to come back to that in this session today and in coming sessions, we've seen in the Nordic region that by investing in these sorts of solutions, you create jobs, quite a lot of jobs, and most importantly, you create local jobs. And that comes back to the need for training to make sure that supply chain is ready for this. And obviously, another <coughs> unit of driver is to address social welfare issue for fuel poverty and so on. We see this happening across uh, the board in every country. There are plans, very more or less concrete plans, but at least plans for how to decarbonize heating systems. In Europe in general, I would say it's a bit more vague than it is in the UK. I'll come to the UK quite very shortly, but there are lots of documents written about a bit focusing on building efficiency, renewables and waste heat recovery. And there are, we can see that in the work we do, there are lots of projects underway across Europe in this field. Uh, UK is actually quite specific in, and setting, a, just putting on the screen two examples on targets, uh, but they are very concrete targets, which I find quite impressive actually seeing it from outside. Uh, by 2028, there should be 600,000 installations of heat pumps every year. 
And that's really tomorrow, 2028 is not far off. And we need to start scaling up rapidly now, both in terms of the supply chain and in terms of training and skills. And when it comes to heat networks, uh, there are ambitions to take it from 2% market share today to almost 20% by 2050. Me coming from the pipe industry, I used to be selling pipes in my uh, job before uh, enter, starting Heat Academy and, and these activities. That represents some 25 million 12, 12 meter long pipes to be put in the ground in the next 12, 30 years. So it's an enormous undertaking. And that's just mentioning the heat pumps and the pipes. There are millions of other pieces of equipment that must be installed. Uh, when it comes to capability, if we look at experiences from the Nordic region, when we did a similar exercise back in the 70s, and if we translate our experience to the UK situation, we can deduct that some 100,000 new staff need to be trained and involved in doing this in the next 10 years. So it's an, a significant challenge to do that, obviously. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a big capacity gap also in terms of the supply chain, which for most of us, we should interpret as a big opportunity uh, we're looking at. And just to briefly mention our activities in this, what we try to, from our angle, to contribute in this process is with our activities in Nordic Heat and Heat Academy, where we try to bring in experience from the Nordic region. It's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer advisory service, but also in collaboration with local partners developing training. And secondly, we also try to collaborate with different regions, universities, business councils, etc., to facilitate business and inward investments. Uh, just briefly on the training, we do focus on training on two areas. It's the professional training side, where more theoretical aspects of design, business modeling, financial planning, etc. And then where the big demand is in terms of skills, it's on the vocational skills where we uh, focus on heat pumps, uh, welding of pipes, installation and metering equipment and so on. But our ambition from the start has been to do it not by ourselves. We would have no chance in delivering all these training activities by ourselves. So our ambition has been to collaborate primarily with local colleges and universities, but also with industry players, energy companies, the supply chain and so on. And it could, I think some of you pre present here now knows that Stoke on Trent was where we started the first Heat Academy uh, activities a few years back in collaboration with local universities and colleges. And since then, we have been able to spread our wings. It looks like we are a global company, a you know, very large company. We are not. But the way we do it is through collaboration. So we collaborate with local players in different markets and different regions. And today you will meet one of our partners, uh, Michael Jacobson, who is in charge of uh, a company in this uh, domain in Asia and also uh, co-founder of the Asian Pacific Urban Energy Association, which can be compared with the Asian version of your heat and power. But back to Stoke and Staffordshire, um, we are, as I mentioned initially, organizing this session together with Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce, but also other local players who you're going to meet during this session today and upcoming sessions. So I'll hand over to you, Sarah, and, um, and uh, oh, to give your presentation. Do you want to run it from your machine? Um, I haven't got a presentation. I'm just going to say welcome in just a few words, and then I'm going to hand over to Scott, if that's all right. That's perfect. I just very, um, very briefly wanted to welcome everyone today. Um, I'm Sarah Williams. I'm Chief Executive of Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce. Uh, we've been in existence as a Chamber of Commerce for over 200 years, so I would say that our founders were probably some of the people who caused uh, some of the issues that we're trying to deal with now. Um, we're very proud of the fact that we feel that we've got a business community that can now happening around the green agenda um, and look forward to working with local companies and our partners uh, to make sure that we can take advantage of all of the uh, opportunities that there are around today. 
Okay, it's obviously really important for us, as we know, as, and as Peter has said, that the, is, the climate emergency is not going to go away uh, and is, in fact, the opportunities for businesses to challenge and develop and provide new products and services to deal with that climate emergency will increase. And we look forward to attracting new investment into Stoke-on-Trent and Staffordshire as well to help deal with that. I'd particularly like to thank, though, um, Peter for his support. Um, the Heat Academy have been a great partner. Uh, we really enjoy working with them. And he's been such a champion of this, both for Stoke-on-Trent um, uh, and for uh, decarbonising heat internationally and locally. And it's been really, it's a real pleasure to work with him on this. And I look forward to our second seminar and hopefully further seminars in the future. And I'd also like to thank Scott Elliott, who I'm going to hand over to in a moment. Um, uh, Dr. Scott Elliott is from Hydrock. Uh, he has a very important day job working in this field. But more importantly, in my terms, is the fact that he is the energetic and very committed chair of our, uh, of our Environment and Sustainability Forum. Um, and through that work, we have now really started to see how we can change the mood music for businesses, understand, get businesses to understand uh, the opportunities that, that are available. Um, and it has pr provided a real dynamism to some of of our policy changes um, over the last year or so. So I'd like to thank Scott very much for his commitment to all of that and his work for the Chambers and hand over to him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, my screen's sharing. It, it's saying it is. Can, can, yeah, is that, is that, yep, yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, so um, it, it's it's great to, uh, to, to be here and, and presenting. Uh, it's fantastic to see um, uh, such a number of people taking uh, the opportunity to come and have a look at, uh, you know, what we're trying to do uh, in Staffordshire. Uh, what Peter gave was a, a, a kind of a, a almost like a, a worldwide overview and certainly a UK overview of what we're going. I want to just bring it back down to a local level to set the scene before we uh, move a bit further forward. Uh, so, uh, like Peter said, we're in the middle of a climate change emergency, uh, net zero by 2050. Boris might surprise us at COP26 uh, by bringing that down a little bit. Who knows? Um, we've already produced a 10 point plan for a green revolution. We've got COP26 coming up in Glasgow, so I'm assuming we can expect a series of announcements leading up to uh, to, to, to that and, and, and policy and everywhere that it's set to go. Uh, I think from, from our perspective in Staffordshire, though, uh, the two key areas are definitely a, a, a around energy supply uh, and about decarbonising heat. Um, and what can we get from that and what's, you know, what, what, what's around the back of that? Well, I think, you know, investments uh, are starting to come our way. Uh, the government are committed uh, through the 10 point plan to at least 12 billion pounds worth of spend. The uh, government had estimate that private sector investment of 42 billion pounds by 2030 uh, will start to channel through to, um, you know, net zero and uh, especially uh, energy supply and, and, and decarbonisation of heat. Uh, and if you're anywhere near or around any investment or any big corporate, and this is start to now move down to medium and smaller uh, business as well, environmental, so environment and social and governance is becoming uh, uh, the, the key buzzwords and the key phrase words. And if you can show a project, if you can show an idea, initiative, which has ESG at the heart of it, uh, then you're going to do well. And we've got progress, which is coming our way. Uh, add to that uh, sustainable development goals, and that's one I think I know Sarah is very keen on and pushing forward on. Uh, and what we should be able to do is take advantage of the projects which are on the ground in Staffordshire um, to, to bring it back to the ESG level, to bring it back to the local level and create local opportunities. And that's really what we're about. That's what the Chamber's about. That's what this event about is trying to switch our local companies on to the opportunities uh, which are going to be available and you know, moving forward um, from everything that's uh, that's going to come ahead. Uh, so what the government are telling us, well, it's 250,000 new green jobs by 2030. They're talking about engineers, fitters, construction workers. I think what I want to talk about is manufacturing. Uh, it's, it's what we excel at within uh, the, the, the Staffordshire region. Installation, uh, we talk about design, uh, consultants. We can talk about monitoring. We can talk about data analysis and we can talk about software. These are all skill sets. These are all companies which are... Uh, already operating sect in this sector in Staffordshire. Uh, and these are all companies that could benefit by switching their view and looking at uh, the, the opportunities that could come back for, uh, from the decarbonisation of the Staffordshire region. So I think we're in a position of strength. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because we've got some really good current projects which are up and running. Uh, Peter mentioned the district heating network. 
if we can link that district heating network to the deep geothermal borehole, then we'll have a UK first, uh, if not, um, you know, come, going up to a worldwide first for what we want to do. So as, as there's real uh, lobbying and pressure that we're continually trying to put on uh, the local authority to see that project through. I can understand some of the, the reticence with regards to uh, incentives and other things like that, but it's a real opportunity working for that. High deploys um, with, with the hydrogen project, which is uh, just finished up at Kiel, but is now moving up to, to up into the northeast. Uh, but that's really set some excellent standards for how we can use hydrogen, how we can blend hydrogen into our gas network, and how we can do that safely, and what that means. Um, we've still got the smart energy network just demonstrator project, which is ongoing at Kiel. Um, We've also got um, the, the Rugeley uh, development for, from NG, uh, which is again, you know, exemplar project in the way that it's going about it. A real opportunity uh, for Staffordshire companies to get involved uh, or around that. And also, uh, we've been working with the Midlands Energy Hub, uh, looking at, at sites for large electric electric vehicle charging parks. Uh, so, really in a position of strength to be able to build on these projects and create opportunities. We've got two cracking universities with Kiel, especially with the hydrogen and, and the smart energy, but also at Staffs University. Uh, there's a couple of profs there that, that regularly uh, come onto our forums uh, for the, at the chamber, um, uh, specialising in micro CHP uh, and all, also organic solar PV as well. Uh, so, so real, real strengths uh, to, 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 to take up there. So to kind of moving forward with that, what, what do we believe we need to do? Well, skills has to be at the forefront uh, uh, of, of generating this economy. Uh, so we want to be involved and we want to see uh, the development of the right skill sets because this is critically important to uh, taking advantage of the opportunity. We need to develop adequate training programmes. We started, we were at the forefront of this with Peter uh, three or four years ago. We've lost our way a bit and we want to pick that back up again. Uh, to achieve this, collaboration is key. Uh, so we want to see and, and, and be at the, and, and in the middle of conversations between the universities, the colleges, uh, as well as with, uh, you know, other uh, such as the uh, Heat Academy. We also want to see collaboration and push for collaboration between public bodies, whether that's local authorities, the LEP or the county council and private enterprise. Uh, there's no way that this transition and this transformation can happen unless it's a public private um, you know, joint exercise to get to that into that direction. And then what we want to see and what we're already seeing and there's plenty of people on this call which are backing that is interest. You know, we're already seeing that interest from suppliers across the UK, but also beyond. Um, and the in, the in the inference we get and the, Peter's telling us this and I'm sure some of the companies on the call today will tell us this as well is that our overseas suppliers don't want to come to this country and, and set up and run themselves. I think they would prefer to work with local companies who are already operational and on the ground. And that helps fit in with the sustainable development goals and the ESG perspective uh, when looking for, for, for uh, working on projects and delivering projects in our region. So how can the chamber help? Well, I think we can help by facilitating matchmaking between these suppliers and installers and our companies are on the ground. So we're very interested in doing that. Uh, we want to work with key stakeholders and are working with key stakeholders to make sure we develop the skills training that's required. We want to help facilitate inward investment, especially towards shovel ready projects. There's money available. It's there. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we can help facilitate that. We can help find the inward investment. Um, we can help uh, you just get those projects moving forward. And we want to provide assistance to chamber members who are looking to maximise on this opportunity. Uh, and the, the last plug is that, you know, we have, you know, if you're a chamber mem member, we have bi-monthly meetings of the Energy, Environment and Sustainability Forum where we discuss all of these um, uh, actions, all of these projects, have a really good membership, really entertaining and good uh, you know, conversations on how we can get these projects moving. Uh, so that, that's me done, Peter. I don't know um, who's up next. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> thanks a lot, Scott, for that, uh, and, uh, that presentation. And I'll hand over to you, Kel, Kel, to give us a more broader perspective of what's happening in the UK and how fast this happened. Welcome, Thank and thanks for joining, Kelly. Thank you, Peter. I'm just having some issues. Can you now see my presentation? Yes. Yay! It is works. <laughs> Super, brilliant. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Greer and I head up the research team at the Association for Decentralised Energy, the ADE, 
um, not hard sell, but ADE with a leading UK trade association. We've got over 150 members across the decentralized energy sector. We look at energy efficiency, heat networks, demand side response or flexibility. We look at combined heat and power, and that's across domestic, commercial and public sector settings. Now, I run a WE team called ACE Research within that. Um, we do work for Scottish Government Bays, Greater London Authority, Greater Manchester Combined Authority on a range of topics. And, and I pulled out a few of some of the key learnings from, from those um, projects. Um, so at the moment, we're evaluating phase three of the LHES pilots. That's basically like a local authority delivery of heat networks and energy efficiency. Um, we're mapping decarbonisation supply chains in London right now. We completed a heat network skills review for Bayes. And we also recently published a international review of domestic retrofit supply chains. Exciting. Now, I could go on and on and on, but Peter said 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep it brief. Um, Peter's asked me to talk about some of my thoughts on mobilisation of local supply chains in the local area. Now, this is a big topic. There's some big numbers in here that I'm going to present to you today. I'm going to highlight some of the research done by the Construction Industry Training Board, CITB, some of the things from our Heat Network Skills Review, some things on LHEs, and a few other things thrown in for fun and for good measure. So what I'd like to kind of wrap up at the end is very much like Scott has just done, which is kind of what we can be done at the local level. Um, perhaps who you could engage with, what research you could do from a, maybe a local authority area and talking about some of the kind of push pull chicken and egg of, of how all of that trickles down to the local level. So the big screen, the big graph on the screen here, you probably won't be able to see the detail, but I would recommend uh, looking at the CITB research if that's your bag and I'll share all of these links afterwards. But it provides, um, they look at the Committee on Climate Change, the scenarios that take us up to net zero, up to 2050. And what they've done is they've broken it down year by year, what types of jobs we need and when. Now, the modelling suggests that we actually need an additional 350,000 full-time employees working in the sector, in the construction sector by 2028, and then predominantly delivering improvements to existing buildings, um, and that represents an increase of about 13% on the current size of the workforce. So just to give you some of the numbers, they think we're going to need an additional 59,000 plumbers and heating ventilation uh, workers, HVAC workers, 86,000 project managers. And that includes some of the retrofit coordinators that are going into properties and designing retrofit plans. Specifically around heat networks, we're looking at about another nine and a half thousand people um, by that date of 2028. So we've got a huge opportunity here in terms of economic development. But at the same time, we understand that there's huge challenge to this scale. The construction industry, the energy, the engineering sectors all need to do more to attract the best talent possible and to change the image of the industry. And that's all about bringing in more diversity, some more women, more workers from the BAME communities, people with disabilities and other underrepresented groups. We need everybody. Bringing it back to heat networks, as I said, we did a skills review. So this is looking, as Peter had flagged at the beginning, how heat networks currently provide 2% of UK heat demand. And we want this to go to sort of 18, 20% by 2050. And that's huge. And what we need to do in order to get to that target is work on our supply chains. Now, in terms of investment, you're looking at at least 16 billion pounds worth of private sector capital within the sector. Um, a group that I sit on, which is called the Heat Network Industry Council, actually put that figure of between 30 to 50 billion pounds worth of investment. And that's just heat networks, really small piece. And as I said, we need a really strong supply chain. The market's already growing, but we've got to do more. We need to ensure that we've got the capability. So can people actually do the jobs, but also the capacity, the number of people um, in order to match the projected market growth? So. Government's working with industry. Uh, they're going to be publishing a, a heat network skills development program in order to rise to this challenge. Industry's doing their thing through HeatNIC. We've got a jobs and skills working group. That's my next meeting. And what we looked at as part of this project, we actually said, let's baseline the skills landscape. 
let's put the sector on the front foot, figuring out what we actually need to do to, to grow both capability and capacity. So we did this research and we actually found that currently the industry is relatively well equipped from a capacity perspective to meet current demand. But there are some exceptions, of course, there's gaps in senior management positions. We've got a real problem with diversity in the sector, as I've already flagged. When you look forward, when you look ahead towards net zero and the targets around 2050, we've got a real big gap. The sector is ill-equipped to respond to the surge in demand. So we've really got to upskill. And it's people like Peter and the Heat Academy, people like the, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, you guys are absolutely fantastic doing this thing. It's actually bringing the sector together, industry, public sector, businesses, all going at once to support that. Now I've left, um, I've, I've created this little uh, diagram that we use for this presentation and it provides the kind of all overlapping skill set that we need to deploy heat networks. But a lot of these are actually relevant to other areas in decentralised energy, whether it's broader engineering projects, um, retrofit, for example. So in terms of uh, we've got public administration and urban planning, we need people who can do that. We've got people who need to do legal and financial aspects of heat networks. So they're not specialists in heat networks, but they are in their area around legal and financial. We've got engineering, big, huge piece. We've got construction and surveying. So that's all your civil engineering and your operations. Then you've got the actual installation of the bit of the kit, whether it's heat networks or something else. Then you've got energy supply. So that's all commercial sector skills, operational, sales, business development, IT, always throwing a bit of IT there. And then across all of it is project management. And it's interesting, the piece we did for Bayes on the international review of retrofit supply chains, project management is a cross cutting theme across retrofit. Having that individual who can sell a product, take that customer, whether they're from a house, a domestic setting or commercial or public sector, leading them all the way through the process, managing different trades, getting that bit of kit into the building and then making sure that they've got that aftercare afterwards. The so project management is huge. So as I said, 86,000 project managers just by 2028. That's a massive number. When you look at some of the things that are coming out of Scotland, and this is certainly true with other kind of projects across the decentralised energy sector, you've got um, a lot of um, skills that are required within you know, local authority, social housing providers, and they're really varied. You've kind of got to be a jack of all trades in some cases. You know, you need to understand about energy, energy use, energy bills, what building physics, building surveys, planning, how to engage with people, how to manage, how to negotiate and kind of influence policy and strategy. And it's really interesting in terms of what's happening in Scotland. And as I said, it is transferable to other areas of the UK, is that there are a variety of skills required. And that's due to the cross sector nature of, of, of kind of these types of projects. And there is a lot of opportunity. So you might not necessarily be the most technologically minded person, but you might be really good at stakeholder engagement and working with customers and sales. So there's a lot of things, a lot of different skills that are needed across the entire journey towards net zero. So kind of bringing it down to the kind of local level, you know, what actually comes first? Is it things like Boris Johnson's 10 point plan, as Scott had mentioned, you know, creating demand and the supply chain responding to that? And then actually the, the skills follow and, and you've got to worry ultimately, is there a risk of creating demand, but then you're not able to deliver? So it's a very chicken and egg scenario. What comes first? And what the likes of the ADE and people in my sector that, you know, they're calling for greater market intervention from the supply chain. You know, the scale of the challenge is huge. The opportunity is ginormous, both at a national level and also local. And that's across retrofit, that's across heat network deployment. And we really need to be careful that we support our supply chains to ramp up but also to avoid the boom and the bust that we've seen in previous decades, particularly in the energy efficiency sector, where, you know, a policy gets turned off or a grant application, you know, the grant money disappears 
and then it goes down and then the supply chain ultimately lays off people. So it's a real push pull situation. It's about increasing demand for products and services and at the same time, increasing skills and making sure that they go in in tandem together and, and making sure that that continues and that demand will follow, the supply chain can follow. So I guess the question that we're asking when we're looking at the, the, the project for Greater London Authority is the moment is, what is it the supply chain actually need to give them confidence? You know, what is their actual appetite for kind of working in this sector? And it's certainly something that we found with some of our base projects, which is you've got, you know, a, your average builder who, you know, they've got full of work, you know, they do kitchens, bathrooms, they could do retrofit, they could look at offering, you know, an air source heat pump instead of a boiler. But at the moment, they don't necessarily see that opportunity. Or even if they do, they've got so much work planned in for, say, the next year, that why should they bother go and do a... Um, a training course, for example, on on you know how to install an ESOS heat pump. Um, so we've got to make sure that it gives them confidence that there is a market there and these are the support they can do it. So in terms of what can be done at the local level, and as I say, this is something that we're looking at from from a, a Greater London Authority perspective, is we're understanding the potential in a local area, and, and for our case, it's London, which is massive, but actually looking at the number of buildings requiring retrofit, understanding where heat networks go, and, you know, for you guys, you're very well placed, you've got Stoke, you know, just to the east of you, you've got Nottingham, which is going to be trialling um, the heat network zones approach, you've got Birmingham to the south, again, another huge opportunity for, for heat networks in particular. And it's then looking at what the supply chain is doing right now. So looking at the sick and sock cords, that'll probably mean nothing to many of you, but looking at what you've actually got on the ground now and then engaging with those to understand their appetite about moving to net zero and what support they need. It's that engagement with training providers. So whether it's Staffs University, Keele University or the broader higher level uh, further education piece and actually saying to them, what are you offering on, on net zero and decarbonisation? How are you actually doing this? And then it's about developing. And as, as Scott said, it's working with the local partners. So whether that's your local authority, your local enterprise partnership, the base hubs, um, and actually looking at your action plan. So what is it the supply chain wants? And then what is it you can do? And that's not for one person or one organization to do. You've all got to feed in together. So what Scott was saying about collaboration, 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 it's all in there. When you've got that, and it's certainly a moving beast, it's not something that's going to be a standalone project. It will move and as, as time goes on. But that's when you can start to see the broader joint working opportunities. So that's working in other areas. So your neighbouring local authorities, your neighbouring regions, and also looking at some of those export opportunities, whether it's to different regions in the UK or whether or not it's internationally. And as Scott had said, it's about people who actually want to come into this sector and actually um, and kind of work with local supply chains, whether that's a procurement piece that they have to do that, working with, with local contractors or working with local staff, but actually pulling that all together, there is a ginormous opportunity for retrofit in particular. And that's it from me. So if you've got any questions, I'm happy to stay on the call for, for a wee while. And, um, and yeah, looking forward to hearing some feedback. Thanks so much, uh, Kelly, for uh, joining us and for that presentation and also for your kind words. And uh, uh, I believe you are perfectly right it's with the chicken and egg dilemma. It's, <laughs> it's clearly a big dilemma in our industry. The problem we face with all the investments uh, we have is that they are today too costly. Yes. One reason they are too costly is there is a lack of people who can actually do the job. So unless we... Yeah increase the capacity and number of people we will not be able to get the projects off the ground yes so i think that's a dilemma and, and we will have a future session focusing on this topic but personally and that again is a lesson from the nordic region is that the government spent in the early days quite a lot of money on training and and actually linked training to government subsidies to project that councils were forced to use some of the money they received for training the staff yep. that by building up a sector. So I think that's a topic, but uh, 
I will hand over now to you, Andrew Briggs, and uh, you will be presenting a bit more in detail what's underway in, in Staffordshire and the region. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Andrew. Thank you, Peter, and, and it's great to be here. And thank you to everybody for I think I'll just see if I can share my screen unless you were going to put this presentation up. Peter. I think I'll you can share it yourself if, if you don't mind. But okay, yeah, I okay. have a backup in case. Yeah, so forgive me, I've got 24 windows open currently. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well, yes, pick one of them. They're just pick one of them, absolutely, Peter. <laughs> I'll try and go and we'll go for presenter mode. Hopefully, you're now seeing, hopefully, you can now see my screen. Absolutely. That's and if, if it doesn't move forward, please let me know. Um, so, uh, Andrew Briggs, I'm the strategic manager for energy uh, and sustainable infrastructure for Stoke and Trent City Council. Um, I, what I really wanted to do as a request from Peter was give you a very, very brief update and, and overview of some of the things that we've we've done, uh, some of the thinking behind where, where we've come from, what we're trying to do uh, and how we managed to sort of take that forward in terms of future opportunities as an example local authority uh, i think is 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 one of the key messages here that in terms of the scale of the opportunity for business in staffordshire uh, and and wider is is what what one local authority the task that we're facing um actually looks like and where it sort of really really does need that huge investment and, and support so i kind of jumped forward hoping that's moved forward peter OK, so um, obviously as a city council, we are a large and complex business and, and clearly uh, as, as, a, as an organisation, our, our core focus is, is, is in delivering of those broader services and functions and statutory obligations and running from sort of houses to looking after people to keeping the roads running to the whole sort of gamut of managing waste. Um, and as, as typical to pretty much every local authority in the country today, we, we're sort of busy addressing legacy issues as much as meeting our legal obligations um, in, in a market that's evolving. Um, and as I think was mentioned previously, those those policy drivers that emerge and, and sort of re remorph and reemerge in different forms regularly from central government and, and currently recognising that you know, the last 12, 18 months has been a very real time of crisis and, and local authorities have had a, a, a significant role in that. Um, supporting the where we, we we try and move forward but recognizing that you know there is funding out there and and we've been you know positive in, in securing some funding um we've we've essentially got a clear view and i think the the climate emergency conversation is mentioned but it is recognized that you know there is no magic bullet and and the scale again as outlined just before is is huge um you know, if just trying to do some of the things that we need to do at the moment uh, will take enormous levels of resource. Um, and from a council's perspective, we kind of have to prioritise what we're trying to do, where we're trying to allocate those resources and, and what's the, the sort of urgency uh, and requirement for us. And I suppose it, it kind of follows through that there are three key principles uh, that we've always been trying to work to. And security of supply, as Peter mentioned earlier, was one of the early drivers for us. And at that time, it was actually in securing a fossil fuel within the city. But in, in reality, that drove us very quickly into that wider conversation around what does energy look like and what does the city um, have as a role in managing that energy conversation, uh, and particularly around sort of certainty of price and cost because clearly that is one of the functional issues that has significantly influenced conversations at the City Council and our overall approach. And, and lastly, but not least, of course, is that carbon mitigation strategy, that ability to decarbonise or provide things that are sensibly much more efficient and remove fossil fuels from the conversation wherever possible. Um, it is just re-emphasising that the message that I think has been sort of stated again, that that, that current you know, sort of reliance on fossil fuels and particularly around the conversation on heat is is so heavily reliant on gas and imported gas that there is a, a massive opportunity commercially and financially for the UK in, in shifting. Um, but it can't also be forgotten that transport is a significant proportion and player within that conversation. Sorry, Peter, I, I'm suddenly getting a different screen. So I'm essentially. Is it not working, Andrew? Or I, I don't know what you're seeing, but my screen just disappeared there. 
All oh, right, we see UK background, three circles. Right. OK, that's fine. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of UK background, that, that simple sort of view that, in essence, what we're sort of looking to, to provide and support is, is very much around that shift from those, those fossil fuels. But as, as Peter again was alluding to before, it's about £26 billion a year spent importing gas into the UK. And if just some of that money could be rediverted into the developing infrastructure, um, into renewable energy, we, we could make significant progress. That I think the key message from, from our point of view and, and the perspective that we're looking at is the fact that there is a, a requirement for a much more integrated solution. We started out on a journey that was saying heat is it, that's what we've got to address. But in, in reality, each of those different components and each of those different areas have a significant impact on each other. Uh, and we have to be really mindful of, of those individual components in our overall approach, but also recognizing that we can, again, create a more efficient solution going forward by integrating all of those different elements. And we've kind of split that out into power, heat, energy efficiency, and services um, in terms of our overall approach. At the heart of that, we've got that ambition for a low carbon district heat network. That is a 25 year ambition. It's something that is strategic. It requires a huge investment, but is a massively complex thing to deliver in a city. Um, it, we have ourselves run up against those skill shortages. We've run up against those issues in terms of supply chain. Um, in, in relative terms, we're an early adopter in the new generation of systems and solutions and our ambitions to have a you know, very efficient and modern facing version of a heat network has created issues for us in our ability to deliver that in a timeline that we would be happy with, but also in recognising how we might provide something that might be described as affordable. Uh, and that's been a major conversation for us over the last few years and remains so as affordability still is at the heart of the conversation for a lot of people. Everybody wants to see the positive outcomes Everybody wants to see the carbon savings, but in many ways we've we've done the easy stuff now. Um, there's a clear recognition, or needs to be a clear recognition, that a lot of things now will come back to the fact that some of the solutions going forward will be more expensive. Um, from a fuel poverty perspective, that's a real challenge. Um, if we've already got, as we have in the city, a lot of people who can't afford heating as it currently stands, providing them with a nice green solution that is more expensive than they got now is not necessarily the right thing to do. So we, we really have to be careful and considered in what we, we, we choose to do. But out of that, we, we've, we've got essentially a whole raft of solutions that are either underway um, or have been delivered in, in some cases now uh, and already having a, a, a real impact for ourselves as a local authority, but also demonstrate the sort of range of opportunities, I think, for other areas who are about to start on that journey. Um, we are you know, adopting multiple systems um, and what we've had to do is bring in a whole range of people. We've worked with Peter and the Nordic team quite extensively in delivering and developing the uh, district heat scheme, but we've also had to bring in other specialists around sort of integration of wider energy systems, defining and developing uh, wider opportunities on uh, power in particular and building skills in our own organisation to address those sort of wider opportunities that come from smarter energy systems going forward. Um, just to give you a, a sort of a, a sort of a, a sort of high level overview, uh, I'm recognising we're a bit short on time. Um, to date, what we've we've done in terms of completed projects, we've got nearly five and a half thousand social houses now with solar photovoltaic systems uh, installed. That represents about 30% of our housing stock. It represents about a 25 million pound investment within the city and that. Um, and it's done through a different model. And this is another aspect of, of trying to adopt models that actually are commercially interesting, commercially useful, but equally are less commercially risky to the council. And it's something that we've had to really be mindful of, of how we get involved. And again, skills, skills shortages, shortages of people with appropriate skills has been a major issue for us within the rollout of that scheme. Um, but it has, is and remains to provide a, a significant impact and positive outcome for the city. Just looking at our own energy procurement solutions, um, we, we've just re-procuring and managing those, those processes has actually helped us save some money, which has funded work to do other things and provided support in managing a very small team that we have at the city uh, and delivering these schemes. 
but actually spending the time to to reevaluate our own ov overall energy consumption, the needs of that consumption, and how we can buy it better, but also where we've got oversized supplies to buildings, reduce those to actually again provide savings which we can reinvest in the development and delivery of other schemes. Um, LED lighting, um, not just sort of working on essentially the replacing the light bulbs by themselves, but actually using that opportunity to redesign the whole lighting schemes, improve comfort, improve lighting across the scheme. But again, demonstrating that in the short term, there are easy ways to provide uh, savings to ourselves and, and use again that principle across the piece in terms of how we might provide a longer term strategic investment in wider energy systems. We, we have been rolling out uh, combined heat and power micro CHP systems in the City Council um, combined with other solutions to provide again an integrated outcome which again is providing us and will provide us continuously for a period of time significant savings by offsetting gas consumption on heating through the um, energy, uh, heat energy produced as a byproduct of that power generation. Currently in the marketplace, clearly we save money by burning gas and um, generating power from that. It's not an ideal way to go and it's something that is an intermediate step, but it is again an enabling sort of roadmap sort of process where we can actually move forward into a better solution over time. But not least of all, efficiency coming through that ability to actually look at how we use energy across the piece the the actual reassessment of the heating systems in one of our key buildings demonstrated we could lose six over six percent of our gas consumption just by resetting the actual heating system without actually going further forward and doing other things the the street lighting and led lighting great lighting replacement programs have clearly delivered significantly across across our area. A lot of those sort of schemes are now more or less complete, but clearly again have had a significant impact. I think the next phase of work and opportunity for us is about how we integrate local energy supply into servicing those outcomes and use the opportunity to generate power locally and use that to provide street lighting, uh, supply services, etc. The district heating, as, as we're suggesting, We've got about four kilometres of primary network installed in the university quarter area um, with the capacity to deliver about 12 gigawatt hours worth of low carbon heat within that solution. That, that solution goes live this year finally. We've, we've, we've managed to get a whole variety of things despite COVID in place. Um, really positive about growing that out and developing it, but recognising the limitations that we've experienced over time um, in doing that, in part influenced by that skill shortage and that ability to secure the right level of support. Developing beyond that, we were actively involved in the public sector decarbonisation schemes. Um, a building energy management system being at the heart of those proposals. Um, the idea that a lot of the things that we all use from an energy perspective, we neither control nor measure. Um, and out of the sort of work that we've actually undertaken, we look like we can take out probably 50, you know, between 20 and 30 percent of our energy consumption by more effectively managing those solutions actively through a, a modern system. Again, in the first instance, we're looking to roll out some further solar on our corporate buildings, having identified almost 17 megawatts of, of roof space potential uh, and capacity for ground mount, which again, if we go back to what the opportunities are on street lighting, on other opportunities to partner with other public bodies or even commercial partners uh, to use that energy locally and create other energy systems. Air source heat pump adoption, we're rolling out, but in concert with other solutions as the affordability question has really come to the fore for us within the use of air source heat pumps. Um, trying to apply them in areas where we've got low temperature solutions that we're actually trying to provide uh, to minimize the financial impact of implementing those solutions but recognizing there are a fantastic way to decarbonize the system mechanical inefficiency upgrades across our networks older pumps older solutions simple things which all add up to a significant carbon decarbonization impact the district heat as, as i outlined before we've got that 25 year ambition but we have identified some significant heat sources. Uh, Scott was mentioning that the real strong support for the deep geothermal option, and we've re seen the, the developer re-secure planning permission and further development opportunities around delivering that solution in the city. We've characterized, designed, developed a full 
deep geothermal opportunity in the city council which we've licensed out to the private sector i'm hopeful that maybe this year we can actually see that come to a a very very positive conclusion and see a significant opportunity arise for the city um, it's challenging because of the current situation about the price of gas there's no two ways about it we face a huge challenge commercially in people's considerations unless they fully adopt the principles that decarbonisation is the real issue um, with the price of gas as it stands at the moment it's a really challenging proposition to, to land having said that that we still have mine water geothermal potential in the city there's wastewater heat recovery opportunities through seats there's in sewers um, there's industrial heat recovery opportunities many many opportunities in a, in a place like stoke that could be addressed and utilized as, as a sort of simple sort of view of, of future potential, um, we've identified a whole series of measures under the local authority delivery scheme, small scale opportunities in the short term, looking at 85 properties for external wall insulation. That scheme was entirely limited by the fact that the supply chain had almost disappeared as a consequence of previous policy changes. Going forward, we're hoping that, that that capacity increases as we bid for the next round of funding where we're wanting to expand and rapidly develop those opportunities and focus entirely where possible on local suppliers uh, to provide that uh, work in, in improving external, external wall insulation on, on private and uh, city council social housing. Um, looking where we can to start out with um, opportunities to start connecting domestic properties again to the district heat scheme. Uh, but also looking at smart and integrated solutions around um, typical characteristics of buildings which are challenging to address uh, and provide a combined solution around insulation, air source, heat pumps, ground source, heat pumps and PV converse combinations. But again, not forgetting the very, very simple and obvious things about just insulating properties um, at a very simple level and recognising that we've in our own stock, we've got at least two and a half thousand properties that need something more in terms of insulation in the roof um, we we do have a, a significant project in partnership with county council uh, energy recovery facility uh, which will hopefully see mo mobilizing later um, in in this decade uh, by 25 26 we should start to see the delivery of our new recovery facility um, disposing of, of a significant proportion of waste from the region but as a fully if, high efficient uh, combined heat and power solution um, essentially providing a new opportunity in the city to provide both heat and power which can be locally sourced locally consumed and provide a secure stable solution I, I can't even really begin to sort of go into the level of detail that we need to look around energy EV charging zero emission buses the, the decarbonization electric electrification of our own fleet you know our bin lorries um as as, as we kind of you know worry about them as, as we currently do as sort of wander around the city at several sort of gallons to the mile as it were and it's about how do we practically manage to to sort of change that um significant cost investment for a council in switching on that fleet changing that opportunity and managing it in different ways it, it's a significant problem for us um, going forward, but it's something that we really have to address. Something that we have done though, and, and it's something that we've we've worked hard at is, is providing the uh, Stoke Depot is as essentially as a decentralized energy procurement organization that we've put together at the City Council, trying to help ourselves procure solutions more effectively and easily to, to speed up delivery in the city. We've made that open to other local authorities and, and public organisations across the country and, and we're looking now to try and relaunch um, next phases or launch new phases of that organisational approach and secure local suppliers onto that framework where we can promote those services, access those services and, and ensure that local businesses benefit from that ability to um, have a, a fast track procurement option um, into delivering solutions themselves we, we are building our sort of wider decarbonisation strategy for the city council um, we recognize that although we've done quite a lot it's been kind of piecemeal uh, and we need to sit back and do that sort of full measurement of what it is and how we actually experience that the sort of carbon impacts across our whole estate uh, and across the city um, and we need to start to plan out for that next 20 odd years to the 2050 but 
try, if we can, to, to improve the, the timeline and delivery overall. A um, lot, of, lot of time and effort involved in, in doing that, but we are you know, going to be publishing something by the end of this year, which will outline that, that detailed journey. But essentially, just, just to sort of finish off and just to reset that sort of conversation, we are one of 333 principal councils in, in England. There are 22 ministerial authorities in Wales, another 32 in Scotland and 11 in Northern Ireland. Um, and, and currently, the, there is about a commitment to 3.8 billion in the current funding rounds committed to heat in the UK, um, of which most of that money is live or is in pro programmes that are currently in bid. So lots and lots of local authorities out there going to be searching out and seeking out for those resources uh, and the people to deliver them. Um, and, and I think it's just reinforcing the messages earlier that that, that requirement for companies to, to step up and, and help us deliver that agenda, but also support the need for the skills is, is really, really important. So that's really it from me. Um, I think <coughs> where I'd like to add, thank you, Peter. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, and uh, we uh, will follow up with questions later on, and I hope you can be present also for our next session, Andrew. Uh, there will be plenty of questions, and as I said initially, this is the first in a series of activities, and today we want to try to cover as much ground as possible. Uh, it's really impressive to see how you're progressing things in, in uh, Stoke and, and in Staffordshire. Lots of different things uh, taking place at the same time, and we're going to come back to that uh, uh, later. Uh, before handing over to one of my colleagues, uh, I just want to share uh, one slide. Um, we uh, are now narrowing down and into the topic of decarbonizing heating, which, as I presented initially, is one of the major sources of CO2 emissions uh, in in the UK and most likely also in in, uh, in Staffordshire. Now, to decarbonize heating, there are basically three areas you can address. Uh, it's conservation activities, building efficiency and building that by reducing the demand for heat. The second is to connect pipes to buildings to make sure that you can have a shared heat system. And then the third element is to convert eventually the fuel to the heat system. The problem is that you need a relatively big heat system in place to be able to do connect a city like Stoke to energy from waste to DP or thermal. Uh, so you need to some extent do this, uh, follow this sequence of activities, conserve, connect and convert. Today, in today's sessions, we're going to focus in on two of the topics. One uh, which is coming now is the building efficiency and coming back to what can be done even before we connect a building to a heat network. And then we're going to move over to the convert side of, of things and move into the geothermal. Uh, where we have two persons presenting, um, and uh, but we start off with uh, you, Bob. Are you with us? I'm here. Yeah. Let me uh, put my screen on share. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Is it is it yep. full size in your screen? It's full size. Do you see my mouse moving around on it? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. I don't All right. Not a problem. Okay. So, um, and that has just moved on slide, hasn't it, to the first it slide? Has. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, um, one of the reasons gas uh, heat hasn't decarbonized in this country is because of the the low price of gas. Uh, you're currently paying four and a half pence roughly for your the gas that you use in your homes. So I'm just going to talk us through the, the three components that make up gas prices and how they're going to change over the next decade. Uh, so the three components are the wholesale uh, part, the distribution, which is the pipes that gets the gas to your house, and then carbon, which there's no carbon tax on um, gas, domestic gas at the moment. So with wholesale, um, we're seeing at the moment on the supply side, uh, courts, environmental actions, uh, taking it to the energy companies. Uh, so there's pressure on the supply side. 
Um, the demand side, here's a McKinsey report saying the demand for gas globally is going to keep increasing to 2037, so the next 17 years, 16 years. So we are going to see uh, the squeeze of supply and demand. So the wholesale price of gas should be increasing steadily over the next uh, 15 years or so. And then we're seeing the conversion from gas to heat pumps. So the government set this target of 600,000 installations per year by 2028. Uh, so by then we'll have uh, roughly 3 million heat pumps installed. By 2030 we'll have about 4 million. Uh, and this is eating into the, the territory of the, uh, the GAF networks. So um, in terms of the distribution charges that you see, your pence per kilowatt hour distribution charge, the costs of running the gas system are going to start falling on an ever smaller number of customers. So you effectively get diseconomies of scale with that. Meanwhile, heat pumps should be starting to realise economies of scale. And we'll gradually see over the next uh, 30 years, once we've ramped up to about a million a year, we'll st see a steady, steady influx of about a million a year, I think, heat pumps replacing gas boilers. Uh, and the third element was carbon. So UK carbon tax on electricity is at £300 a tonne at the moment. Um, and on gas, it's pretty much close to zero. It's zero for domestic and it's £25 for, for commercial. Uh, and these dots on this graph represent a bunch of different viewpoints from different organisations like Google, Facebook, um, uh, London School of Economics. Um, and the Carbon Trust about what carbon prices should be in the 2020s, 2030s and 2050s. And we're seeing it rise over that period. But what we can see is that UK gas is kind of well under the curve and UK electricity is well over it. So we are expecting a shift. And, and the thing is, to hit that 600,000 heat pumps target, you're never going to do that with the commercial zones you are at the moment. So we are expecting a shift that takes some of the taxes away from electricity and puts them onto gas. Um, politically, it's difficult to do, but it will be happening. Um, and this is just showing what's happening with um, the carbon emissions of electricity. Uh, they used to be up at this level, sort of uh, 500 grams of CO2 for every kilowatt hour. Uh, that was when we had a largely coal run system. And then it dropped to this uh, and it's, it's gradually dropping. And we can see we've got a trajectory down to 2050 where it gets close to zero carbon. It's because we're, you know, we're moving towards offshore wind, we're closing down coal uh, and we'll have car carbon capture and storage in there as well. Meanwhile, gas will probably stay up quite close to where that blue dotted line is. It's a little bit below that blue dotted line and it's not likely to decrease by much. So the shift towards electricity is going to be the main decarbonisation. This is a report by Regen showing that the taxes are all on electricity with almost nothing on gas. And they're suggesting we need a big shift and they're suggesting a kind of all in one shift. And they, they think it'll only put, put a 14 percent increase on the cost of gas uh, and a similar decrease on electricity. That's if you do it this year when carbon prices are low still. The longer you wait, the higher the carbon prices get, the bigger that shift percentage change will be. So although it's politically difficult to make the change at the moment, it's easier now than it will be in the future. And with COP26 coming up, we're expecting some kind of announcements this year. This is on their agenda. They are talking about this. And there is a lot of lobbying going on. So we're expecting gas prices to rise significantly by perhaps 70 percent, perhaps even double by the end of the, the decade. And that's going to change the economics uh, entirely. Um, plus, on top of that, you've got the end of gas boilers at 2025. There will be no new gas boilers in new build properties. And then I'm going to switch hats. Uh, now I'm going to put my retrofit coordinator hat on. So this is a fairly new qualification that's come out and it's about improving the standard of the retrofitting of homes. Because um, in the past, historically, it's all been done piecemeal. Someone's come along and they've put some windows in or they've put some loft insulation in and it's not joined up and the quality assurance isn't there. 
So there's a new project management role uh, being created and it's compulsory for a lot of public sector grant funding at the moment. Um, so and I just want to talk through some of the steps that this qualification includes so we get an idea of what it is doing. Um, first of all, you've got the, the quality assurance and risk management there. Uh, so higher standards there. You're looking at the thermal efficiency, but not just about the insulation. You're also looking at managing moisture. So we've all seen those problems where buildings have been insulated, haven't thought about the ventilation strategy. All of a sudden you've got mold everywhere and your air quality has deteriorated. Um, so you have to think about those in conjunction. Uh, your insulation, so you're retaining your heat, your air quality, your ventilation strategy and your moisture. Uh, and then actually thinking about, because the cheapest way to improve a, a home is to do it all at once, but no one's got the cash for that or the desire, you know, they're living in their homes. So the part of the role of the retrofit coordinator is to make a long term plan that fits in with your lifestyle, your money, your ambitions, uh, so you can think about what needs doing when. So if you know you're going to have to replace your windows at some point in the future, you can plan to do external wall insulation at the same time. Start thinking about things in conjunction with each other. Um, finally, on this list, you start getting towards the building services. So that might be um, uh, changing out your boiler for a heat pump or connecting to a heat network. Uh, they're the most likely options for, for most homes. So uh, three core elements, as I mentioned, your the heat supply, the air quality and the moisture. And you've got to be thinking about those three elements uh, all together as part of this long term plan. And the long term plan, uh, you're thinking about how uh, as different measures come in, how you might do it with regards to people's lifestyles. So new babies, um, inheritance, older children moving out, all these big lifestyle changes that change how you use your home and it gives you opportunities to change the house uh, at that time. And that is the end of this pr presentation. I rattled through it because I could see we we're a little behind on time. Thanks a lot, uh, Bob, for that. And we're going to come back to this topic. This is a highly uh, a topic that's becoming increasingly in focus. Uh, we have to uh, recognise that there are lots of buildings that will not be connected to a district heat network in the foreseeable future. and. We need to do something with these buildings and there is, as you can see here from Bob, plenty to do uh, even and, and in that process, making them ready for a heat network uh, because over time a heat network will be critical to reach net zero in, for the heating sector. One uh, and thanks again, Bob, for that and uh, one technology we often talk about the fabrics and changing windows and so on. What's interesting and what has become a growing sector in recent years in the Nordic region and increasingly so also in the UK is using digital technologies to optimizing buildings. These solutions are relatively affordable compared to changing windows in, in, uh, in, in big scale. So I'd like to introduce Christian Johansson from a company called Noda uh, based in Sweden. And you have a long background in this sector. So welcome to the session, Christian. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, yes, it's correct that you can do quite a lot with just digitalization and using the new technology you have to by retrofitting the, the buildings. Actually, we're doing quite a lot of work, not so much in Sweden when it comes to gas, but in Poland and Germany, we have a lot of buildings where we are retrofitting them in order to control them in a better way. We're using what's already there, but we just control them in a better way. And we regularly see savings around 15% or more in these buildings. So that's the gas you will save 15%. And uh, I mean, this is something you can do in, in when you're waiting for, you know, change for a heat pump or building a heat scheme or so on. So these are things that can also be considered quite well. I'll try to keep it short, Peter. I probably I know that you're a bit. Let's see here. I sorry. I will share my screen. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Great. just to keep it short. Yeah. So you see my screen now. And 
I just want to start off with this also because I, I mean th this is good, important point also. I mean, if you have renewable energy, then it's good to use that. So obviously we're trying to reduce energy, but that's when it comes to fossil fuel. We we want to reduce gas usage and oil and so on. However, if you have renewables, then use as much as possible, increase capacity. So that's a lot, lot big portion of what we're doing also when it comes to using utilization is to increase capacity of renewables in combination with reducing uh, fossil fuel obviously so so that's this combination i think it's important to to consider also and obviously why we're doing this is to decarbonize and we i mean you know this obviously but there's a lot i think it's very important to stress this that there's a lot of energy being used for heating and cooling and if you look in Europe, it's more than one third of all the CO2 is actually from the buildings themselves. So there's a lot of things that we can actually do with just the buildings. And we see that digitalization can really help to create these significant impacts on this. I mentioned 15% on gas is on general, but we saw also in, when you have geothermals, for example, you can expand the capacity of these things. We have one project where we actually expanded the capacity with 40%. So you can connect 40% more buildings to the same geothermal well just by controlling the things smarter. That, 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 that kind of changes the whole, um, you know, the, the budget for such a project. So it's, it's very important to consider these things also. Just saying that that's a bit of an outlier, that project. I think normal, normal cases, 10, 20%, but that's still quite a lot that you can just control things smarter and you will, um, you will get this, uh, these benefits then. Um, one thing you also when we talk about applied, applied AI in this in digitalization is that it can create value in all the parts of, of these projects. So even in the startup of a start of a project here, it can help you to gain insights and also provide uh, decision support for doing measures in the buildings, for example, preparing them for a heat scheme or so on. And then when when you have things up and running, then you want to optimize these things and, and provide a good ongoing service for these things. And when it comes to the customers, we, we try to work with data management and AI to engage customers, engage people. And then once you have it you know, connected, once you have a project up and running, then you want to empower them and keep them involved in the process. And I think it's very important here uh, in the, if you want to optimize energy systems to engage people, building owners, tenants, and so on. The drivers behind this, I'm just skipping through quite rapidly now because I know we're, we're short on time, but I will send you this presentation so you can look through it afterwards. Uh, the drives of digitalization, it's really, as Peter mentioned, also it's quite cost efficient and it's because things are becoming very much cheaper all the time. All these gadgets that we need to install, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper. And also the, 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 the algorithms and technologies we use from a data perspective it's becoming increasingly uh, efficient also. Um, one thing that really drives also uh, is promoted by digitalization is that we can create these system of systems. So things that can, different types of systems can work together in a better way. And this is something we see in this group now of uh, that we work in the Heat Academy. Um, there are two companies that are not here today, but I will, uh, I will include them here in this case because it's a very in interesting way how to work together in this kind of setup. So you have, in order to do a smart system, you need to measure things, input the data, you need to analyze the data, come up with good solutions, what to do, and then you need to actually control so the valves actually move when you tell them to. And if you combine all these things, it's quite a big automation project. But we have a Finnish company called Sofita that we uh, work quite a bit with also, and they measure things, collect data, they provide the data, uh, data management system. And on top of that, um, Noda can come in. We do the analysis, crunch the numbers. We go from all the data, create information. Based on the information, we create knowledge. And this knowledge can then go back to people and organizations working in these projects. So you go from the, the pictures here with the nice colors below, and then you go to a climate quality indicator of indoor climate, for example, that can be used for a control system. And one example of that is the control system from Setatown, which is another company working in the same group also. They provide HIUs and heat, um, heat controllers uh, and uh, substation district heating. So this is 
a good example how you can actually create benefit from digitalization. A system of systems, measure, analyze, control together. Now that I mean, we do, we have a focus on content digitalization, AI solutions, machine learning, and we try to work together with partners on a global scale. We're doing most of our work in, in Europe, but also quite a bit in North America and Asia. So it ties together all these things. And we, we did a big project in China last year during the pandemic. And without digitalization, we had to go there and install valves, but now we could just do everything online. And we, we set up, I think it was 30 high rise buildings in China during the pandemic, which is it kind of shows the impact you can create with digitalization. Um, we have different types of solutions working on this. The point is, without going into details now, is that digitalization provides us, us and Sofic and Setatem and all these other companies provides us with the ability to deploy this in different ways through cloud solutions, technology transfers, and knowledge transfers also, which is a very important part of this also. And it's all fueled then by uh, digitalization. Um, we work with something we call the partnership concepts. And we're trying to uh, always find good partners. This is, I mentioned Sofix at the time, but it also applies to local and regional actors, installation, maintenance, sales, customer engagements. All of this is something that we always try to find local partners in order to build a good uh, value for, for the end customer. So, and this is, again, it's, it's, it's enabled by digitalization. These are just two uh, simple customer cases. I won't go through them now, but I will send you the presentation. And if there are any questions on this, you can just uh, please let me know or come back to Peter. So thanks, Peter. Back to you then. Thanks a lot, uh, Christian. And as everybody could recognize, this uh, was very much about awareness and a teaser session. But I also want to, to have this here today because this is a typical training session we offer uh, through Heat Academy in collaboration with suppliers like Noda, but also then in collaboration with local universities and colleges. So this is something we would like to bring up uh, in as we move forward in Staffordshire with local universities to actually run full scale training sessions addressing these topics. And it's clear that uh, Digitalization is, is, has come late into the district heating sector or the heating sector in general, but it's growing at a very high speed. And this is a huge opportunity you have in the UK. Uh, when you build new system as you're doing now, you can use the very latest technologies. So again, thanks Christian for joining us today. We're gonna bring you back, you know that. Uh, but then we move over to the other topic I mentioned, uh, the geothermal, and we could hear Andrew Briggs mention that there are have been a project underway for quite some time, and it uh, is still very valid, and that's why we feel deep geothermal and geothermal in general is an interesting topic to address in a session like this. And I'm very grateful uh, that we have you, Ian Stimson, with us today from Kiel University, and you have a long background in this particular topic. So welcome to the session. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so a quick uh, 10 minute tour through geothermal energy, um, something that's uh, hugely diverse, ranging from the very near surface and temperatures of tens of degrees down to the deep subsurface and temperatures of above 100 degrees centigrade. So, um, So basically divide uh, geothermal energy into two uh, main categories, the deep geothermal, which I really classify as greater than 10 meters below the surface, uh, which is where the source of the heat is internal to the earth. So it's radioactive decay and heat from the early earth. And we can divide that into hot, dry rock and hot, wet rock, which I'll come on to in a minute and uh, shallow geothermal, uh, less than 10 meters from the surface, where the source of energy is external to the earth, uh, the, basically the, the sun's rays um, heating, heating the earth's surface. And that's um, what we effectively call ground source heat. So, 
So a variety of geothermal uses from um, at the top end power generation through a whole host of agricultural and industrial uses um, down to uh, domestic heating and, and warming of the soil and things such as that. With the ground source heat pumps, they work essentially how your fridge works. We have a, a working fluid in a pipe. Um, it expands um, from a liquid to a gas, uh, extracting heat, and then we compress it back to a liquid, giving up that heat behind the fridge. And we can do the same thing uh, with your house. Uh, we can take heat from a, from a room, uh, compress the refrigerant, which heats it up, uh, take off some of that heat to uh, heat the domestic hot water tank, uh, and then in summer, put that excess heat into the ground outside the building. And then in winter, uh, reverse things over so that we can now take heat from outside the building, uh, pass it into our system, compress the refrigerant, heats things up. Again, we can take some heat for domestic hot water and also for heating the building. External to the house, we've got our um, either a closed loop system or open loop systems into uh, sh shallow aquifers. This is a closed loose loop system with uh, basically antifreeze running in a uh, coiled pipe buried just below the surface. Um, it works particularly well under asphalt. So uh, on the right, we've got an example of a bus station in Suffolk uh, where the turning area is used uh, for uh, uh, ground source heat. And uh, the M1 has experimental stretches uh, where um, heat from the summer is stored uh, and then used for de-icing in the winter. We can also submerge coils in uh, lakes, ponds, canals, rivers, uh, and so forth. We can also put the ground source uh, heat pump technology uh, actually within the foundation piles of buildings. This is one new change in Cheapside in London with nearly 250 closed loop uh, systems actually within the foundations of the buildings and with a couple of open loop systems uh, is uh, one of the most uh, largest uh, ground source heat pump systems in Europe. Moving swiftly on to deep, ge deep geothermal, we traditionally think of this in areas such as Iceland, where uh, there's very hot rocks closer to the surface, uh, but the technologies are now allow us to apply uh, deep geothermal uh, in countries like the UK. The general idea is to find a hot rock relatively close to the surface, something uh, like granites are ideal because they naturally contain uh, radioactive elements which uh, increase their heat generation. We uh, have a series of boreholes. We inject cold water into one of them. Uh, that then generates a series of uh, microfractures which connect up with to producing wells. Uh, and the water passes through the network of small fractures heating up, that hot water is then pumped to the surface, passed through a heat exchanger where it's used for um, heat and power, and then the cold water is re-injected back down again. The uh, issue with these uh, open loop hot dry rock systems is that this process of um, fracturing the granite um, to connect up the systems uh, is commonly known as fracking, and is somewhat frowned upon by uh, environmental activists. So in order to get round this, uh, a couple of things, the oil and gas uh, technology used uh, has been adapted to uh, pump down a, a working fluid, typically supercritical carbon dioxide, uh, to depth where it's heated up and then brought to the surface. 
where the uh, heat can be extracted either in uh, simple vertical wells or in wells which are deviated um, from the vertical through uh, about several kilometres horizontally and then uh, are brought back to the surface again. The other approach which is typically used in the UK now is to look for areas of rock which are naturally fractured by geological faulting processes. And this is the approach taken by United Downs uh, in Cornwall, where they've got a couple of uh, deep boreholes that intersect the Porth Town fault zone and uh, cold water is pumped into uh, the, the fault zone, heats up along the way and then extracted uh, at depth and uh, they're about to do their final reservoir testing in the coming week or so, and they've already sold uh, some of their electricity from this project. Uh, also, this is uh, approach is being uh, now adopted by the Eden Project, and they have identified natural fractures at depth, uh, which the, they can use uh, to provide the permeability and the flow of water between their injection and producing wells. The other uh, potential approach is to look for areas of limestone terrain uh, where uh, fossilised uh, karst systems, cave networks and the like can be used to, to have that uh, permeability at great depth. Which sort of brings us on to Staffordshire. Um, the reds in this image are where our basement rocks, uh, potentially hotter rocks, are that much closer to the surface. And you can see particularly uh, in North Staffordshire, this is true, giving us an elevated geothermal gradient. We've also, uh, uh, this, these high areas are also potential areas of cast in the Carboniferous limestone. And we've also got uh, major fractures uh, crossing this area, which can provide, again, the natural permeability that we require uh, for uh, connecting the injector and uh, produ uh, production wells. So um, this is a uh, cross section uh, running from Kiel across towards Newcastle and out towards Etruria. Um, we can see a couple of uh, major fault systems crossing this and the, there have been plans for several years to uh, drill a well from uh, the Truro Valley down to intersect uh, this fault system at depth uh, and extract uh, hot water where the rocks are uh, naturally fractured by the faulting. And also if they intersect the Carboniferous limestone, there may be uh, uh, fossilised cast uh, to assist the permeability down there as well. The other main uh, area of deep geothermal is hot wet rock, looking for um, aquifers which are naturally salty, so they're not going to be used for uh, drinking water or irrigation, um, but they're naturally uh, porous, so there's no need to fracking. We can just uh, drill into them and, and pump the water out as we would with a, a normal water well. Um, and there are a variety of areas uh, around the country uh, that have suitable uh, geology for this. Uh, Southampton has been extracting uh, hot water uh, for a ge local geothermal plant uh, for, for many years now. And there are plans to, uh, for crew in uh, Cheshire East to extract uh, hot water from the sandstone uh, sandstones deep below the Cheshire Basin. And then we've got the mine water geothermal potential, about 7 million homes in the UK, that's about a quarter of households are above worked coal, uh, principally in the north of England and southern Scotland, but also areas like South Wales. Um, there's a huge uh, potential for extracting water from these abandoned workings. And the modern uh, district heat networks can run with 
uh, temperatures as, as low as 20 degrees centigrade and we're combined with a heat pump in the house to, to boost that heat uh, are very efficient uh, heat systems as you don't need the as much uh, lagging as you do on the much higher temperature systems. And most of the cost in these systems is actually in, in the boreholes. So in these systems, the, the general idea is that uh, we drill into some of the deeper workings where the uh, rock has heated up the water. We pass the uh, water through a heat exchanger uh, into a district heat network, and then we can pump the wastewater back into some shallow workings and over time uh, the water will uh, permeate through the rocks heating up heating up as it goes uh, back into the deeper parts of the system. There are also some very interesting plans to use some of these mine workings as um, effectively heat batteries so that when we overproduce renewable energy um, we can use that to heat the water and then recover that heat when uh, the days when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. So I've had a, a number of students now working on uh, uh, small geothermal projects around Staffordshire. Uh, this one is from Kiel uh, from last year, identifying um, a number of coal seam abandoned workings close to Kiel. Uh, in this 20 to 40 degree centigrade range. I've also currently got a, a master's student uh, working on a similar project uh, around zero carbon Rougely. So um, shallow geothermal, green spaces, car parks, lakes, canals, shallow aquifers, so your sort of low risk, low, lower reward options. The higher risk, higher reward options are the hot wet rock, the deeper uh, geothermal in Cheshire with around the Perma Trias and uh, the hot dry rock of the Carboniferous limestone and um, granitic basement of, of North Staffordshire. And of course, the mine water uh, geothermal potential of uh, former coal mining areas. So in renewables, focus is often always on wind and solar, but tends to ignore geothermal. And I'd argue that you can't have wind and fire without earth. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ian. And I fully subscribe to the, what you've said there at the very end. And uh, the more I work in this sector, the more I realize that there is a fantastic potential for deep geothermal or geothermal in general, but deep geothermal and not least in Staffordshire. And uh, the question we ask, we are used to work on the surface, uh, but there is a group of people which are specialized in, in finding their way down into the ground. And those are the people coming from oil and gas sector there where these depths are quite common, I understand, having watched the Deepwater Horizon movie. Uh, but I'm really glad to introduce Carl Farrow uh, from Serafi. Uh, you have a long background from oil and gas and now you, together with colleagues, are moving into the field of geothermal heating. So welcome uh, to this session. Thanks, Peter. Good to be here and thanks for everyone for uh, inviting me along. I'd like so, to, what, what do you think of this uh, opportunity? We, we, you're, you, you're not presenting slides, which is good. Uh, yeah. But, yeah but, well, how, do you, um, how do we get down there? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's really interesting hearing everyone's comments. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, from previous comments, uh, you know, there's a lot of perception about the geothermal space and about what can and can't be done. Um, you know, one thing we learn or I've learned in oil and gas over 30 years is um, that every well we drill, no matter where it is around the world, has heat. And, uh, you know, the deeper you drill, the hotter it gets. Um, so, you know, Serafi really came at this as an, a, with a different mentality of trying to um, engineer a solution for geothermal rather than just relying on Mother Nature and science, because, um, you know, Mother Nature in, in certain aspects is not always in the favour of where we want it to be and when we want the wind and sun to blow and when we want to get their, uh, the energy to, to the source we need it. So, um, so our, our approach is very much um, 
going for the heat uh, using oil and gas application. Uh, we've um, now got proprietary technology and uh, really to drill down to anything really above 100 degrees C, we can start looking at electricity from now um, by inducing the environment, um, very similar to a whole ground source heat pump business, but at several kilometres rather than metres. And uh, what we do is um, then inject proprietary fluids down there um, to create a rapid boil off in the in the in the um in a in a in a flash motion effectively like supercritical motion um to create the energy to either bring it back through an orc to create um you know large volume heat which can be used for large-scale heating and uh, industrial uses um or at the same time provide a, a, a chp approach and um and i think this is really what this whole industry or sector needs is really this um order of magnitude step up in approach um, to really get, um, well, first of all, money and uh, investment behind it. Um, because, you know, money, money. every time you mention heat, people go, uh, uh, when they get excited about electricity, but no one really gets excited about heat. So it, our approach is if you're going to add the sort of um, the CH with the P, P to it, it also gets tends to get investors a little bit more um, excited. And, and also scale also brings... I think order of magnitude um, level to project appetite, and certainly when we talk about you know bringing skills into the the, the arena, and uh, you know we we we've connected oil and gas to really the heating system approach, but our our real focus is really subsurface, and you know that includes mining and and anything to do with subsurface. Um, so I think yeah, there's a huge huge um, potential here and i think you know this is where we've decided to sort of focus our expertise i think there's a massive um uh you know opportunity here for not just um uh you know decarbonization in general but also the esg aspect of being able to add in like agriculture stacked agriculture decarbonization of um you know bringing in green hydrogen and stuff like that as well from from the use of the use of heat so this is really where we uh we really see massive um uh, you know, a need to focus, but also be able to create off the back of our an industry that we had for nearly 60, 70 years now in the UK from oil and gas. And we can actually, we have all the expertise there and the technology uh, sitting in right in front of us. Um, we don't need to build windmills from Sweden or from Scandinavia in the UK to power our energy. We have oil and gas expertise to transition over and do this. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we shouldn't be relying on foreign uh, short parts and uh, infrastructure to actually support our energy um, moving forward. So I think, you know, heat is going to be the solution moving forward. Um, you know, we've only been going a quite a short while, but we've opened off offices in several countries over the, the last six to 12 months and uh, purely off the back of demand, not because we plan to do it, but purely of people saying, you know, when are you coming here to, to do the same? So We've sort of scaled up, got investment, got in interest, and been able to build a business fairly quickly off the back of, um, of a you know a, a desire to do something differently with an impact change solution. And this is really where I see the the heat industry moving in the UK. You know, well, it's clearly a very big opportunity you have in the UK with this long experience from oil and gas sector. I used to sell pipes to oil and gas sector, and I know it was enormously difficult. Very, mm. very high quality requirements and health and safety aspects. So you could bring a, and your colleagues bring a lot of skills to the sector. Having said that, I, I, I guess there are fears about deep geothermal. One is obviously the risk mm -hmm. of hitting a dry hole uh, or yeah. if you can say that when it comes to heat as well. Uh, and we all you often hear this argument, I guess, that well, oil, there is a lot of money in that business. Uh, it's not the same in, in heat. What what what's your reaction to that well you have to adjust to it i mean you know we we're in the same position as everyone else today and you know we've we've come from oil and gas but one thing we didn't bring is the prices you know we've uh you know we've brought the the expertise and the skills but we've also brought the mentality that if we want to do this and, have, and do it properly we need to do it in uh, in line with uh what's sustainable and what's affordable and uh you know, those that want to come on that journey from oil and gas with us have to come to the reality that this is not, um, you know, 150 bucks an hour barrel of oil price. This is, uh, you know, several several pence per, per kilowatt hour or uh, several pounds per megawatt hour. It's a different world. But I think, the you know, the, 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 the scalability is what makes it attractive. 
you don't have this you don't have the ability to scale in oil and gas like you possibly do in this sector and this is where we see potential so we've bought you know technology license and ability to scale and produce a effectively a launch pad for investment and technology off the back of what we're doing um, which brings scale which then brings um the the interest in 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 uh you know generating revenue and everything else which is what stakeholders are looking for so i think you know again it's about I think order of magnitude de-risks um, by, you know, if we do things, you know, large enough with a bigger appetite, we we tend to spread the risk. And I think also the approach of, um, you know, because we came from oil and gas, because of our ability to sort of look at that innovation, we're also now looking at reconverting onshore oil and gas wells, um, using the energy from them wells uh, to produce uh, electricity. Um, we've just taken over several sites in the UK and we plan to do more. We're working with on- onshore operators and offshore operators um, with the, you know, the appetite to look at decarbonizing um, existing wells. So these are, these are, you know, and, and you have to do, you have to do step change. You know, it's about, you know, when you, when you change anything or when you bring any form of change to a industry, you can't do it and expect to get the same price or expect to get the same no. result. No. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be, you know, price differences. Uh, some great points about gas prices and this being a challenge, but you know, gas prices are not going to be relevant very shortly. So we have to get away from that mentality and uh, get to the reality. There is going to be carbon taxes moving forward. It is going to be a reality globally, and uh, you know, we have to take that risk now and move into the space before it's too late. You know, what I think is uh, that Staffordshire is really an ideal spot uh, for for this. I mean, we heard Ian mentioning earlier about the, about the the heat underground. It's a good location. So the first place we've got heat. We could also we heard Andrew Briggs mentioning uh, the heat network underway, and that's obviously critical to have the heat network in place so that you can distribute the heat being brought up from the ground underground. Uh, further to that, uh, you know, the, the, the skills at Kiel University, the research that has been done there over years and the concentration and know-how. And then finally, you have a number of companies in the region uh, mm. to link up with. We, You and I had a meeting last week or week before, I can't remember, with Scott. And I think what's your reaction to this, Scott? Could this be? And then I should mention before I let you in, Scott, there are two very interesting mine heat projects in, in, in the region, Shatley Whitfield and also in central Stoke. So, Scott, if I invite you first to, to comment on this. Uh, well, well, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the, the chat that's going on the, on the side is, is fascinating and uh, has been really interesting kind of listening and, and, and keeping going and on, on the comments which have been coming forward. Um, it, it's clear, you know, that th- th- there, are, there are two or three, aren't there, um, hotbeds for geothermal uh, technology and for geothermal innovation and i had the fortune of working in cornwall along the original hot dry rocks project a number of years ago um but also then uh, having the 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 knowledge and and actually working with uh, gt energy as was uh, on the uh, deep geothermal borehole uh, here in in etruria uh, and the, the 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 opportunities the opportunities rife and around us like like anything it just needs that element of collaboration um uh, it, it needs that just to, to the, the 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 ongoing discussion with the local authority uh, and companies like carl's just to build a picture and getting getting around there and and I, and I do think that the, the difference with what Carl brings to this and potentially brings to this is that multi-vector approach. Uh, so if we take the Etruria Valley uh, itself, uh, if we see, and uh, in fact, I'm surprised you didn't hear it where when I was giving my presentation, currently the new roads being put in literally 100 yards away from my office window and they're vibrating the stone in and building the bridges. So that road's going to open up the old um, uh, the Shelton Steelworks um, uh, across there. Uh, there's the ability for uh, large EV uh, st- um, uh, charging facilities. Uh, there's going to be big distribution sheds on there, I'm sure. Uh, and then, then the district heating networks coming this way as well. So it, you couldn't have a better uh, spot to be able to pull together um, a project uh, and a deep geothermal borehole. And if we can expand that borehole or, or around not just being district heat network generating, but also into a CHP, uh, uh, into all these kinds of things there, and then la- link that into some form of urban farming. Um, we've also, I've also seen some really innovative 
um, really innovative ideas around the use of, uh, of uh, excess water off rooftops um, from within uh, distribution centres for outdoor swimming pools, all these kind of things. We just got, you know, it's time to think a bit innovatively, uh, but also use the resources around us. And and and, and within Staffordshire, uh, whether that's deep geothermal, actually moving into Cheshire as well, whether that's deep geothermal or whether that's the, the shallow geothermal from a mine water heat perspective, uh, there's an abundance of it beneath us. And we just need to put our thoughts, our scientific heads, our technical heads, our manufacturing heads to how we can exploit it. Mm -hmm. Now it seems to be a perfect spot and Chris Fogwill, are you still in the conversation as well? I mean, you, you've spent a lot of time focusing on this topic at Kiel. And again, uh, this is uh, the academic angle to it and it, it just seems that there is a perfect match here. Yeah, I think obviously as, as Ian outlined, yeah, regionally and obviously Carl picked up on, regionally there's huge potential. but. The bit I'm really excited about, this is sort of building up on some of Carl's comments, yeah, this is a potential to really, really open up the opportunity that's been sort of handed to us post carbon century. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree. There are real challenges around the business end. There are real challenges around looking at actually what is the profitability, but actually what is the value and the social value as well as the, the sort of value to the, the community? Because as you were saying, the, the potential to link into everything from community projects to actually opening up opportunities to bring business into the region as well. You know, if you can underpin that, and that was always a sort of central tenet of this year, if you can underpin an energy ecosystem and offer the potential of cheap rents, cheap bills, actually the potential to drive growth is huge. So I think there's some really exciting pieces to be explored here, both socially, but also in the geoscience world. And I think some of the points you made, Carl, are really, really valuable, because actually, how do we make that tilt for the oil and gas industry? Uh, we run the um, uh, one of the hubs for the Get Net Zero um, uh, Centre for Doctoral Training at Kiel, and actually that's looking at what's going to happen to the North Sea transition, you know, yeah. in this move forward. We've got to re-tilt those skills. The oil industry is the only industry that has the logistical ability to be able to underpin us. And yeah. like I say, it actually offers something that the UK does and does well, which is really yeah, it's also it's that global It's that global um, export value as well. So you know, it's OK, you know, one thing is looking at the holistic approach for the community, the local or even UK PLC. But, you know, being able to build this to have another 50, 60 years of export value, you can take around the world and actually, you know, prove that as well. I think that's that's the bit yeah. I think UK PLC really needs to get behind. You know, we didn't build an, in, an oil industry in, you know, three or four years. It took us years yeah. uh, to do that. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't just try and forget that we should build on it and add yeah. to it in a new transition to energy you know yeah i think that that investment is crucial at this point you know we're all, we're almost missing the window if we do not move quickly you know pandemic aside if we don't make this till quickly we will lose out i also you know just one i know we've got sort of time running but just one point i'd like to make is there seems to be i think that a big a big piece of opportunity missing in the in the heating network area by focusing on the smaller low hanging fruit rather than looking at the bigger picture and the, the bigger picture for me is like decarbonation of heat in industry and getting into them big chunks of um of companies that need to decarbonize as part of their mandate they have to do it it's like you know they, they don't need to they're not worried about their homes or anything else they're worried about their their esg value and that so by by targeting them and providing them with solutions you automatically get the spill off from domestic heating and all the other things that will come to it but you need the big off takers uh to actually to buy into it you know at the, fr at the front end and i think that's the bit we're trying to focus on as the industrial partners because if you can get 60 70 percent of your ppa or your or, or your offtake taken by a big commercial user the rest of it all just falls together with the domestic and all the other parts that, that can come in you know two topics here two points here i'd like to add this is something we are definitely coming back to because we see a critical, fantastic opportunity um, with the different stakeholders and the potential. And also briefly, Andrew Briggs, you have been looking at deep geothermal for quite some time in the projects. And this is the other strength we have in the region, the fact that you actually have started to put pipes in the ground, because without that, there would only be a geyser in the city, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. I think yeah, it's it's really fascinating, and the really positive thing is that 
significant shift that we've seen over the last couple of years, and particularly through the pandemic, that people have absolutely changed their their attitudes to this, and they are thinking beyond. I think as as Carl was rightly saying, this 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 view that gas, the price of gas, and it is a big issue. It is the big issue. I mean, it, it's seven times difference. If you're doing electric heating, kilowatt of heat is 14p. A kilowatt of heat from gas is is two. You know that's a big gap to travel. But if we do see that shift, if we do that, but fundamentally having that difference, we've identified 14 megawatts of heat potentially underground. We know that temperature is likely to be at least 105 degrees. We know that there is a whole range of opportunities immediately you know, a, around that area, a lot alongside the other opportunities that that Scott was was referring to. You know, you've got a swimming pool. You've got a major hotel. As I say swimming pool. It's it's the UK's largest swimming centre, as it were, in, in terms of water world. It is a a very interesting location, and I think that shift again in technology around the the ORC and that dropping of the temperature range at which that becomes successful that the price point that you can actually benefit from exporting power to offset that. But I'd also go, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing noises that government is sort of waking up finally. I mean, we burn a billion pounds a year supporting Drax to burn wood. You know, we, we kind of, well, there are some interesting conversations that need to be had with people. You know, you're running big ships across the Atlantic, burning heavy oil to sort of deliver wood to be delivered by diesel run trains from sort of Immingham to sort of burn in, in a bloody great power station uh, for a massive subsidy is, is something that, you know, we, we kind of have to have a different mindset within other things because it's right that the heat opportunity is where we came from. I mean, there are process industry issues. There are a whole range of other opportunities. Stoke still has process industries. And I've seen the chat on hydrogen. Hydrogen has its place and there are significant opportunities carbon sequestration opportunities around getting some of the gas out the ground in the city, using that for different things. Process industries like ceramics will still need a fuel. And if it's not methane, it's going to have to be hydrogen. How we produce that is a different thing. And that blend of how we approach power is, is one of the other things, because the grid itself is becoming massively inefficient and unwieldy. I, I recall that we used to have about 60% overproduction of power on the UK's network. We now sit with three times the total demand capacity sitting idle waiting for a contract for a call off. So there are some significant opportunities if we can get that mix right. Um, the opportunities are enormous. Um, no, and I think I, I'm afraid I need thing. to break a break in, and, and we're gonna uh, run it. I think I will have a conversation with Sarah and Scott about that we should run a separate focus session on geothermal because it's clearly it's a huge opportunity and I think it's great with the points that you bring to the industry as well Carl in terms of impatience and also not being scared of scale I think scale is what we need we can't be too shy when we do these things well, the, money, want, yeah, the money is there I mean yeah, the the money, money, I know the money, that there is the money and we could, I could read yesterday energy. about the big big oil companies now moving into this sector but before we we round off this session. I, I'd like to highlight a few of the topics we're going to focus on in the next session. And you mentioned, Carl, the export potential, and it's not only for geothermal, uh, and also potential for inward investments. And we have with us uh, Michael Jakobson from Asia. Are you still with us, Michael? I'm still here. Thank you. And, uh, sorry for delaying before you could join us, but you will be with us on the 7th as well. And I wanted to bring you in, Michael, because you are collaborating with loads of different industries in the Asian region and based in Beijing. And I see we discussed this and our opportunities for cross fertilization between Staffordshire and regions in China and the rest of Asia. Uh, yeah, please, uh, a few minutes, we, we can run a few minutes over. Sure. No, I think it's been a great uh, discussion here today, and I, I uh, would just like to touch a little bit upon the the importance or, or the opportunity of exporting technologies. Uh, I mean, in my position here, I, like like you said, Peter, I'm I'm uh, based in Beijing, and I've been uh, in Beijing for about 15 years, uh, and developing and optimizing district heating and district cooling systems across the region. And I can just say, I mean, the market is huge. Um, and looking at the district heating markets here, China is uh, relying on 80% of the fuel is based on coal. 
something like that. Kazakhstan have 85%, Uzbekistan have 100% gas, and they are looking at decarbonization. And, and what should they do? Well, I mean, geothermal, we have heard about that. It's a huge potential, uh, simply. Uh, energy efficiency, of course, uh, it's a great potential. All these kind of technologies that, uh, that could be uh, developed uh, in Europe, there is a great potential for export to this part of the world. And, and also, there are some technologies that is also worth looking into utilizing in Europe as well. So, I mean, it's a great, great opportunity for um, yeah, collaboration across borders simply. Yeah, and as I said, we're going to bring you back on the 7th. I wanted to, thanks for joining us today. I know you have a busy schedule over there, and it's pretty late in the evening as well, I guess. Uh, but th thanks again, and you will be back on the 7th. Before uh, finishing off the session, I'd like just to share uh, two slides about what's coming up next. Uh, so this was the first uh, in... Uh, a series of sessions we're going to run the next on the 7th of July, where we're going to pick up on some of the topics we have discussed today. I'm sure we're going to bring geothermal back on track. We're also looking a bit deeper into building efficiency, what can be done short term. And finally, we're going to pick up on the point we didn't have time to touch upon today, and that's the heat networks, the connect, uh, connecting buildings where I think what Andrew has presented, there has been a lot of work done there. Stoke is very well positioned and, and you need the pipes to explore deep geothermal or others, uh, other sources of heat. So please note the 7th of July in your calendars. We come back with a more detailed agenda. Next week, we're running a session in Belgium where we're going to highlight the recovery of industrial waste heat. So another source of heat, which is uh, increasingly being explored. Uh, we're going to combine that actually with what Scott mentioned, urban agriculture. There are some really interesting cases in Belgium where they are using industrial waste heat and the few, uh, bringing it to, to greenhouses and, and to grow tomatoes and other things. And then if you also could make a note on 13th of July, where we're going to run a session in collaboration with the Coal Authority and BGS, uh, British Geological Survey, uh, focusing on mine heat. Uh, so please note these, these sessions. We're going to come back in upcoming newsletters with more information on them. Uh, that's uh, all for today. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hand over to you, Laura and, uh, and Sarah, if you're still in the session. Uh, it's been great collaborating with you, and we look forward to going forward. Yes, fantastic. Thank you all for attending today. Really appreciate it. Appreciate we ran a little bit older, but I think we um, managed to call some night back. Some fantastic um, discussions going on in the chat as well, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And for those of you, um, like Peter said, and um, we will be running a session on the 7th of July. And for those of you that have attended today, and um, what we will be doing is we'll be sending you a link anyway, um, just so you are there ready um, for the 7th of July um, and very exciting things coming out of that today. Um, we'll also if you do know anybody that wants to come to the 7th of July as well, that's not a problem as well. We'll also pop in that email as well and um, Peter's details and my details so that you can um, grab a link and um, for anybody that does want to attend the meeting that hasn't attended um, today's meeting as well. Um, Sarah, is there anything from you? Oh, I've lost you. I'm just kidding. Sorry, the screen went blank. Because it was um, uh, no, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's been re really useful, really helpful. I've got pages of notes of things and ideas that I need, I need to talk to Peter about. Um, uh, no, been 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 really helpful, and I think um, a, a great start to what I hope is going to be more of these sessions and a longer collaboration. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks so again, and I should make a final note saying only that you get the uh, recording and also the presentations through, uh, you're going to get a link tomorrow to be able to access that. And for those who are Scottish and English in the session, good luck tonight. <laughs> and see you soon. <laughs> bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye. bye Thank now. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.